Howdy out there. This is Ed Darty from Suncoast Technical College, and I'm going to do a rewind of the talk I gave at H Tech at uh, TCAT in Tennessee, Murfreesboro. Um, but this time I'm going to wear my project manufacturing shirt, and I should have worn that at the time. But as an instructor that ended up in the finals, every every teammate got a shirt with their name on the back, and the instructors had just plain shirt with no name. And then they gave us some swag on the way out. So got my Project MFG mug. So I'm going to speak. I'm promote. Yeah, I am promoting Project MFG because I really like it. But our how we got into it and all the unknowns and try to figure out how this thing works. Anyway, let me continue on here. See if my screen's working. Oh, let me move myself over to here. Okay. We do not have a five axis machine, uh, but we were able to su successfully teach it and do the projects um, with our machine and our school. We have a fourth axis. And that was round one. They send you a kit. You don't pay for anything. They send you for a kit. You got to just sign up uh, to, you know, declare who your team is. Three, four, or five people. That's usually a four is like the most common uh, arrangement. They'll send you a kit, and you, as an instructor, is all you're also the proctor, and you're not to assist them in the um, in the competition. So you're actually, it's like running a skills competition in your school. Only you have to do it within 16 hours or two, two eight-hour days is the goal. But we did it as, I think, uh, we split it up into three-hour days in order to get the timing right. Because we had a high school uh, student that is only here for three hours a day. So we set up the schedule. But I had to, I reviewed everything. As an instructor, I can review everything. You you get everything but the solid model. You get blueprints. You get the book. You get solid. You get the material enough to make two parts. You get tooling. You know end mills, cutters, and all that stuff. It's also a welding project, so you get all the pieces that need to be welded together. And the book is pretty uh, thorough as far as. What needs to be done? It really does replicate how it is in industry. And I have over 30 years experience in the industry, so I can speak from experience. I've only been teaching 10 years. Anyway, so when the time comes to start the competition, you are to oh, assign who... I, what I do is I, I run it like a company, like I'm the boss, and uh, Everybody's got a job to do in this backup job. So, like, somebody's, like, the foreman, somebody's a programmer, somebody's the welder, somebody's going to run the machine, set it up. But of course, they, they can help each other. And the programming part on the CNC end is now I'll give them the solid model, and they had to work on it. So there's programming time involved. There's setup time involved. The welder's got to do his welding. And then we have to inspect it. So the first round, they actually sent us uh, a manual lathe part to do, which was kind of interesting. That was no time limit on that. You could you could do that up front. And what it was was a shaft that two bearings had to be uh, press fit on. And that's part of the assembly that goes into the trophy base. So that one you do up front. You put that aside. Then you start the clock of the day of the competition, which means it's they're starting with nothing. Uh, here's, here's a tool list. Uh, here's the solid model. Here are the blueprints. S start determining how to, how to do this, how to set it up and stuff like that. But of course, what we did is a lot of prep work and I would give them similar scenarios. So it was just a Hopefully it was just another, it's just a different part at this point. So it's not like you're trying to teach them how to do everything. So, so we did the manual part, which was a part of the assembly. We did the CNC part, 
and then the welder did his welded base. And you are to assemble the whole thing, make sure it fits and everything. Put it back in the box and ship it to Project MFG headquarters, and it has to be in by the deadline. And then they will inspect it, and that will determine if you go on to the, I think it, they call it the regional route. So local is qualifying. Then you go to regional. If you're selected for the regional, um, they will fly you to that location. Now, oh, let me throw a picture of something up here while I'm here. No, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Okay. And um, this year was $100,000 to win. That would be in the finals. This is an example of one of the blueprints from the first competition in 2019 that was sent to me. And I was talking about how we didn't have a 5X machine back then, and our HFO wanted us to buy a MC750, and we were unable to do that. But uh, we did, this is what we had in our shop. We got a VF2 with a the smallest rotary table they make, the 5C indexer. And you have a, a sample of the indexer there. We have a TM1P and an ST10. Let me slide myself up here. But we also been doing Titans of CNC projects. So we also... Uh, learn how they did some of their projects, like that Nicole there is holding the trophy she made. And she had not done, never done five axes before. So I figured we're doing a trophy. That's a trophy. There's similarities there. So, And uh, not that I'm promoting any cam. I, I teach Master Cam, and I also teach Autodex Fusion. So we, we were using Fusion 360. All right. Uh, I also looked at some uh, his history of the competition. 2020, there's some shots here from uh, the finals at Danville Community College in Virginia. And there's some pieces there. So I'm trying to like learn as a teacher about it. There's some more pictures there. Programming, running the machine, all that kind of stuff. Then last year's competition got a, a little bit better. Of course, we're coming out of COVID, so they had to do the finals at four schools. But you notice that it is a TV crew, so if you end up in the finals, you're going to end up in their YouTube video, which you can review the 2021. It's about 55, almost an hour long. It's pretty good. Um, the 2022 one should be coming out, I think, September 7th, I heard. But you got like uh, the lower left is Calhoun, and they were there this past year. Upper left is TCAT. There's a Danville up in the upper right corner. So that's the four finalists. This was called the, the video. It's called Clash of Trades. It's a cool video to watch. Uh, this is a copy of the blueprint from the qualifying round right there. So you can see they're industry standard blueprints. Very easy to. See, you just don't get the solid model up front. So, you, you know, as far as, and it, to me, it was uh, okay to review the project up front. That's how I read the instructions. To review with the team, This is these are the parts, this is what you're going to have to do, but now you're going to have to do it. you got to take the model and make it. But as far as, like, we look, go over, like, the critical dimensions and all that kind of stuff, surface finish, tolerance, you know, the, you know we'll come up with the process, the plan. Uh, we did some practicing. So because we only had a fourth axis, we did a Titan 139M cube on the left, which I think it should be a, a first multi-axis project for anybody. And I know you get the discussion of do you do 3 plus 2 and full 5. We weren't thinking of it that, that way. We just did whatever we needed to do to, to make the part. But the on the lower left is a 3 plus 2 part. And the middle one is a uh, Fusion 360 cam sample. So we just took that and made it. Plus we were learning how to use dovetails. And then we did another one called the Charmander, which was just some random grab cad piece we found on the internet and we just machined that and that was an stl file so it had a lot of triangulation facets on there so it's not very smooth but it gave us an overall like rotating and machining so we did that as four axis also 
139M right there, so you can see our programming and stuff like that. Uh, we use the dovetail to hold it initially. And that's the Charmander one. We did, uh, actually, I sent one of the girls to go find it, and she had it 3D printed in our classroom next door, and then we decided to make one. So we held it with our three-jaw check round and machined it, and then we cut it off. And then we had this Fusion Cam sample, which I think is an excellent uh, part. That's actually got full four axis, if you want to call it that way, rotational, and uh, three plus one, I guess you'd call it in the four axis world. It came out really well. So we're learning about how to do this. So this is the part we did. And because we had the four axis, that's the material they sent us. We cut it in half. On the upper left-hand corner is uh, how we set it up with our dovetail. And since then, we decided if we were to do this again, we would do it different. But this is how we did it at the time. We did machine the neck and then flipped it and machined the top and the bottom. So we did it in three operations. Now, the competition does state you don't need a five-axis machine, but I know one school had attempted it as a three-axis which meant you had to hold it and rotate it maybe, probably like four times. Um, so it can be it can be done, but it can be challenging. So on the on the left, whoop, there it is right there. That's the one we sent in. You know, we sent it in with the assembly uh, and hoped that we qualified, and we did. And this is our pitches at Swick. Southwest Illinois College, which is just outside over the river from St. Louis, Missouri, but it's in Illinois. This upper left picture is uh, Tyler and Clint, who were in charge of setting up running the machine. Uh, there was a UMC 750 that belonged to SWIC, and there was a UMC 500 next to us. So there was two teams competing at the same time. So how they ran this portion was one day was programming, eight hours. One day was your, that's your turn on the machine. So in the upper right corner is the programming crew. Now I will say that you're also judged on how much time you spend. So if you had eight, if you had four people programming, it would be more expensive than two people programming. So, so you get, it's a little bit of like, how do you, how much money do you spend? Do you break tools? You gotta buy tools. You have to use another piece of material. So that's cost. So that's cost like on a real job. So we brought in our, you see a blue bag there. We brought in some of our own stuff to bring with us because we had to fly on a plane. And uh, and we just work out of the bag as far as what we needed to do because we had to bring some like uh, measuring stuff, you know, precision pins, things like that. But they supplied all the tools and everything. But we bought our own torque wrench, things like that. All right, but this is also the first time anybody in my class has even run 5-axis, let alone that UMC 750. But I'll tell you, with the simulation and the CAD CAM, it makes it so it's not daunting. And I probably think that I was more worried about it than they were, so. And no problem at all. And that's our finished part right there, the welded component. And they gave us the neck up front, to work on and they gave this other other thing on the day of the competition the surprise component which is the part on the top and we got that done with like 10 minutes to spare before the end of, the, of that second day and it machined pretty good just a little bit of chatter on it but at that point I guess uh, I think we were the only ones that had got it complete you got that far so we were feeling pretty good about ourselves there were 12 schools still in the competition at that point. There were eight at SWIC, and there was four at TCAD. So we flew home, and uh, I guess you wait a week or so to see what the results are. But we ended up in the Final Four, and they flew us to Wichita, Wichita State U, their tech center, and this uh, the team shirts right there, just like the one I'm wearing. There's three of the students right there, Clint McGachey, Tyler, I can't still pronounce his name, T. Chikek, and Josh Lucas. And there's also Chris Holmes, who was always camera shy. So uh, we won a 
for toolboxes in some other side competition. They shipped them to our, the school. And this is just us hanging out and stuff. I have a lot of pictures of the, uh, the time we had. So it was a very good team bonding event, I'll tell you that, uh, as far as how they work together. And sometimes I thought I was getting in the way because I, I think I tried to butt my head in a few times. But uh, it was a great experience, I'll tell you, as far as that goes, especially going making a real part. And on the upper left, you see this uh, crew there, a TV crew, there's probably about 10 to 15 crewmen there. On the upper right was the three judges, and, and Andrew Crow was one of the judges, and the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the guy who leads the show. But we had John Saunders from uh, Saunders Machine, NYCNC. I forget the weld girl's name, but she was kind of in the welding area. And we had a third guy that was from a company from the Danville area. And they do a lot of uh, high-level work there. So they were the judges. And we ended up, uh, this was our assembly there. That top piece is called a spinner. And it did turn into a design competition at the end. So uh, you had to design your own spin wheel. But all the other components were solid models. We did win this longest spin time. But uh, we still came in fourth. Probably because of, we did, I think, break a tool and we did have to use another piece of stock but we were able to complete it and we actually took home we didn't get the hundred thousand dollar prize but we i personally took home a check to the school of fifteen hundred dollars they all got a check for fifteen hundred dollars each and two thousand dollar toolkit so and it didn't cost us anything to travel they picked us uber picked us up we all stayed at the same hotel all four teams who were all hanging out with each other you know, before and after, uh, they fed us all the time. It was really, really great. So, um, how we did it, the students, I think, were proficient in setting up a CNC machine. We've done a lot of machining. Uh, we are a one-year school, and at that point, we're only halfway through the year. So, I, I really try to teach uh, people to be good setup people. I think there's like three levels of CNC in the in my history of what I saw on the shop, you have your operators, you have your setup men, you have your programmers. Uh, so I wanted them all to be proficient in setting up it, all four. Uh, then we, we make sure we're programming proficient, like two and a half axis, and then we get into three axis, and then we, then we get into multi-axis. And we just learn as much as we can. Now, we typically don't actually teach the multi-axis till the end of the course, and we just kind of lightly touch on it. But these students were very advanced, and they were running out of projects, so it was a good opportunity to jump in on this. Okay, let me move myself again. Oops, I'm on the wrong side of the screen here. All right, so I actually talked about some things you need to know just about the five-axis and what do you need to know. Uh, and if you have a five axis machine, you should be dabbling in these areas anyway. Like work holding as differences, using self centering vices, dovetails, lay chuck, using collets. You can use collets for work holding. I think fourth axis, and just speaking for myself, uh, helps uh, a lot of people to learn just the basics of multi axis. But what are we actually talking about? The Haas 5C setup is really supposed to, uh, I think, because, because it comes with a tailstock to take lathe parts and, and do the milling features on it. So if you don't have a multi-axis lathe, like a four-axis lathe or live tooling lathe. So it, it gives you all the con concepts that you need to, to talk about the multi-axis world. So I think four-axis does not limit you at all. Uh, a UMC versus VF. Now we have a VF and we've, we're trying to get a VF TRT trunnion to update it. So as far as the cost, cost of machine obviously can be a pinch point. But if you have a VF and uh, you can put the, the, tr the TRT or trunnion on and just teach it as a month or two and they can take it off and just put vices on. I, that's how we, we, we plan on doing. So you can convert an existing sh machine for less money. 
But if you go UMC route, you can also run it as just a normal three-axis machine because it, on the side it has a, a place where you can put a normal vise or you can just put the vise on the platter. So on this one, this is a BF2 with the with the trunk. You can see the TRT table on. That's going to be how our setup is going to be at some point, hopefully this year. Right. So that was our road to five axis. Now let me go back to some pictures here. Yeah. Call up some pictures. Okay. That was our. Let me see if I can forward these things. Pull up my screeny again here. I'm running out of. There we go. I used the tail stock because of the dovetail. I was, I had we hadn't done a lot of dovetail work, so we were concerned that uh, it would rip out of there. But I think in the end, it actually holds pretty good. But we put that in there for support. Now in hindsight, we've we've done it so we did the top and the bottom first, and then we we machined it a base that would go clamp in here and hold it by the base, not dovetail base, but. And then we would do the neck. That's how we would do it from now on. But that was our first setup. And that's probably a video of it half machined on that side. And the neck. And we make sure we, you know, we got to make sure where we are in the rotation. We set up to be uh, the Z axis and the Y axis on the center of rotation. So we got all our engraving in and stuff like that, and then we then we machine the end. So actually locating it after this was kind of critical to get all the numbers right. And there it was with the neck done, and then we moved to the regular mill. And as Joshua running it, he uh, should have his safety glasses on. And this is the part of the welded component. And that's finished. That's our VF2 with our Skunk Works logo on it. Another finished part, finished part, finished part. And we had to put it in an oven <laughs> to assemble the shaft. So we had a little toaster oven there. And there it is, bearings pressed in. And there's the book right there, the project manufacturing book, the uh, playbook, they call it, on the bottom. And both components. It had to, uh, yeah, it had to hold compressed air like ten pounds, I think. All right, I don't know what that thing is, but anyway, let me shut this part off. So that was our road as far as uh, how to get there. I, I, I encourage everybody just even just to get the kit and look at it. You can spend, you get the kit now. I think they're shipping them in October. And at some point, um, that's my dog, Sydney, snoring next to me. Um, you can look at all over the book. Um, you can read the rules. My interpretation of rules is we can review the book. Um, we can't make anything up, up front. You know, I don't want to make it so they're practicing on the real stuff. I, I did we practice on similar stuff like the manual lathe part we use the, the nims uh, turning on centers part as practice we took some of that other four axis stuff and that was similar stuff so as far as practicing on the real stuff we didn't do any practicing on the real stuff but you're prepping them you're prepping them to take on another challenge so you take that book and get the kit and look at it, and you can determine whether you want to jump in or not. Now, I know uh, another school, a friend of mine, they got the kit, and they decided they didn't have a welder, but they wanted to attempt it on their own. So they just kind of treated it as a project just to learn from, which I think is, is very viable. But if you want to treat it as, I want to be in the competition, just run it by the rules, make your parts, send them in, and maybe you'll get the email that you're going to the next round. And then you just got to determine. Now, I'll tell you, the only catch that I had, I had a high school student, and I didn't realize I had to get a lot of, like eight weeks permission in order to go out of state. And I should have done that. I wasn't really aware of that. 
when we do skills, we have somebody else that takes care of all that for the year. So if you intend on going to a competition, I would get all your approvals done when you do the first round so you don't so you don't run into that issue I had. That's all the only issue I had as far as my director decided to back us up because uh, it wasn't costing the, the school district anything. So that's about all I can tell people, I think, uh, as far as what there is to do. So I think you'll answer most of your questions by just getting the kit. But the more I looked into it, I think I was trying to like trying to figure out everything up front too much. And in the end, it's once I saw it, it wasn't that big a deal. And and we I just treated it like, like we got to hit all these numbers, and you know we don't know who how well everybody else is. So we just we just try to treat it like industry. We're trying to deliver it per print, you know, and on time. That's really the goal of the competition: is can you do this job? Can you do it? budget can you do it to spec and can you do it on time that's pretty much the focus of the whole thing all right i'm going to finish my project manufacturing coffee and uh talk to you guys later bye bye